Bill, you know this industry well. Does this deal make sense? Well, it's a very bold move by Giovanni Caporio. Uh, I think their pipeline definitely needs uh, beefing up. They've been losing to Catruda on their mainstream uh, Devo drugs. And uh, Celgene's got a heck of a pipeline. They've got four major drugs in, in the pipeline coming along. They're very attractive. And so this is a bold move, and I think it all depends on how these drugs come forward and if they get to market and if they get to the FDA trials. And if they do that, it'll be a real winner for uh, Bristol-Myers, and if it won't, <laughs> they will way overpaid. Uh, there are some obvious uh, synergies in the deal because they are right next to each other in New York, New Jersey, and they can take out a lot of costs. Of course, the risk of that is that they might lose a lot of the talent in Celgene, and they can't afford to do that, so they've got to make sure they, they keep that talent. But I would note with regard to the 54% premium that Celgene itself is down about 40% because of some of the market's disappointment on Juno. So I anticipate that uh, this could be uh, worth paying. But on the other hand, <laughs> you look at the prices this morning, Bristol-Myers is worth $74 billion, and that's exactly what they're paying for Celgene. So uh, it's a big risk. Bill, we've already seen quite a bit of M&A activity over the last couple of years in, in healthcare and in, uh, you know, among the drug makers in general. Do you think this continues the consolidation wave? Well, it's consolidation plus it's, it's focus right now. I mean, you saw some of the other moves being made, like, uh, uh, you know, the spin-off, uh, Pfizer spinning off its OTC business, and, and Bristol-Myers did a similar thing in a smaller business. I think everyone's got a focus right now at Biopharma. It's hot. That's where it is. And the top companies are worth a great deal if they turn, if they uh, per perform. Uh, and so we'll see what happens. But uh, uh, I think uh, it makes a lot of sense to concentrate your energies. Cancer drugs, immunology, gene therapy, cell therapy. There are a lot of new therapies coming along. I know Novartis has paid about $15 billion in new acquisitions in the same space. So you're going to see the majors all investing heavily on, uh, on bulking up their future pipeline because uh, they can't afford to have drugs go off off, uh, off bat. Bill, what's your read on what this particular move says about the industry overall? I mean, the degree of risk that's being taken here, does that speak to uh, seeing opportunity or perhaps more toward the desperation end? Well, I, I see it as, it, you think tech is high, high, high risk? This is really high risk, high gain. And these, and the, the, one of the key risks here is pricing. They're charging very high prices. I mean, everyone wants to get into CAR-T like Novartis did. And uh, that's one of the things that Celgene was in. And, you know, the prices are extremely high. And if they hold and if the Trump administration doesn't move against pricing, which I'm not, I'm, I'm kind of betting they won't, uh, then these are going to be incredibly valuable pipelines as they come to market. And, uh, and help people, particularly in cancer, because you are saving lives. You're extending lives and people that have no choice. And when you get into one of the things that uh, cell genes working on is glioblastoma, there's just no treatment for it. So I think the industry, John, is going to continue to trim out OTC and other generics and other peripheral things and focus entirely on uh, how do you get uh, the top pipeline and how do you advance these technologies. Bill, it's been such a big topic of, I guess, expectation, speculation, this idea about drug pricing reform. Why don't you think it happens with the Trump administration? Well, because they haven't moved in two years. There's been a lot of bluster, but I don't think they're going to move. First of all, the law says the government can't negotiate uh, on pricing. They'd have to pass a law, and they'd have to be bipartisan, and I'm not optimistic today about bipartisan deals going through. The Republicans could have done it when they had control. And I think they chose not to. So I think you'll see pretty much open pricing and then uh, downward political pressure on prices. But that only goes so far. I mean, you saw a lot of new prices coming in January 1st. Uh, there, people were really aggressive, like Allergan, uh, pushing up their prices. And I suspect you'll see more of that. Uh, now, I'm actually a believer in some price competition. But all these drugs we're talking about in the Belgian BMS deal, uh, those are all... Uh, you know, those are all on patent, and uh, those are all brand-new life-saving drugs. So I think they should have an opportunity to recover their research sure. because it's such a high risk. Um, so what, is this, what does this scale actually allow them to do? I mean, if we are expecting more consolidation within pharma to respond to this and, and these companies gain scale, 
What does that buy them in terms of getting drug approvals and, and pricing and, and those sort of issues? I'm, I'm not a big fan of scale. What I'm a fan of is having a lot of options in your portfolio because you don't know what's coming, Sarah. At Medtronic, we had a lot of options in our portfolio. And you, even there, which is much more predictable than biopharma, uh, you didn't know what was going to make it and when it's going to make it. And you get punished badly by the market if you go off bat and you don't have a replacement. So I think this gives Bristol-Myers many, many more options, and I think they've got to have those because there will always be setbacks. There will always be trials that don't work out. When I served on the Novartis board for 10 years, uh, you could come yeah. right to the end stage and not know whether it's going to make it or not. And if it does, you've got a $5 billion upside on revenues, and if it doesn't, you've got to go back to the drawing board. And that's happened to both the companies. So I think having more options in your portfolio is a real plus, and I think all the majors have to. You can't just depend on one or two major drugs. And uh, the cost of buying them after they're on market is truly exorbitant, and this question of if there's any shareholder value in doing that. Bill, before we let you go, I just want to shift gears for a moment because you've served on quite a number of boards across quite a number of industries. Uh, what are you hearing in terms of this economic slowdown in China? And at what point across these different industries would you expect this to become a greater risk for U.S. companies? Well, I think the China risks are very real. And now the Trump administration is talking about making a deal. I'm much more skeptical about a deal. I'm not, I'm not sure. I think you could have a papered over deal kind of like the... Uh, former NAFTA, U.S. MCA. Uh, but but I, I, think, uh, I think that's the big risk. I think the market's definitely slowing down, and the big players like Apple are very honest in announcing it. And, uh, General Motors has a heck of a good business over there, and, and a lot of companies do. So I think it's a real risk for people. One, the market slowed down, Sarah. But two, I think right behind that are trade negotiations. And, uh, you know, Chinese government can act unilaterally. They don't need a Congress to approve things. They can do what they want to do. And so I think it's quite a big risk. I felt that for throughout 2018, and now it's coming to, to the fore. Uh, I think the Chinese will take steps to improve their own economy, but I think they may be less uh, friendly towards American companies unless we get a very attractive trade deal. And I hope we do. Uh, but I, I think it's going to take a lot longer than anyone thinks. The, the Chinese do not move quickly on deals. I can tell you that. If you want an intellectual property deal and you want market access that people have been working on for five years, uh, that's, that takes time. So I think it could be a, a significant risk for anyone with a, a large uh, China percentage in their portfolio.